Our next speaker is Steve Graham, General Manager, Innovation and Biometrics, NEC New Zealand. Steve leads NEC's innovation design framework and research and development investments, as well as focusing on the execution of bringing biometric solutions to new and existing customers. So I think Steve might have got a heads up that I was the understudy because he pulled me aside like a couple of minutes ago and he said, hey, in his accent, which I won't kind of try, but you'll know what I mean. He goes, hey, come here. All you have to say is he's going to talk about cities' future relevance, and he wrote it really big for me. So I think with that, I pretty much just need to say that. Steve's going to talk about cities' future relevance. We're going to play a short video, um, and then Steve's going to come up to the stage. So maybe we just welcome him now while we queue up the video, and then he'll take us away. NEC has been a big supporter of mine, and I know firsthand when they get behind something, they go all in, which is why I'm excited to share with you their deep involvement in the incredible transformation of Western Sydney. NEC is offering our most innovative technologies, such as smart transport, e-health, biometrics, digital government, education, and cloud services to enable the vision of Western Sydney as a 22nd century smart city to become a reality beginning with a seamless travel experience for those arriving or departing from the new 24-hour Western Sydney International Airport. The new Sydney Metro West connects Parramatta to Sydney in just 30 minutes. NEC's expertise in operational artificial intelligence will help government and private operators deliver smarter, safer, more reliable transportation for citizens. In the beating heart of Western Sydney, nearby the Western Sydney Aerotropolis and across Western Parkland City, NEC will help our partners create a home for technology, science and creative industries, including connecting and digitising Bradfield City Centre to become Australia's first truly 22nd century city. At the new Sydney Science Park, NEC Technology will help Celestino create a $5 billion mixed-use smart city aiming to be an internationally recognised epicentre for research, development, education, commercialisation and innovation, including CSIRO's new Urban Living Lab. In Parramatta, NEC as a foundation technology partner of choice is helping the team to create the stunning and technologically advanced new Powerhouse Museum. Australia's newest Hollywood and show business magnet, the Lakeside Studio Complex, is planned to be constructed at Penrith Lakes. With 10 sound stages across 96 acres, these international film studios will feature NEC's next generation technology and digital displays. Partnering with Suez, NEC's leading big data digital smart city energy management platform will help deliver a sustainability plan focusing on enabling carbon footprint management and the journey to net zero. And NEC IoT technology will also be critical in helping Sydney Water connect the new recycled water plant to residents, industry and local council areas. As Western Sydney grows from a population perspective, it's critical that we bring high class, high quality jobs and no better way to do that than to bring the world class technology that NEC is known for right around the world to our backyard right here in Western Sydney. There's so much happening in Western Sydney right now. It's not just the innovation and technology, it's the story of how so many different organisations and government are working together to create one of the world's first truly dynamic smart cities. And that's where you'll find NEC, in their happy place, right behind their customers and partners, delivering something very, very special. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Steve and uh, I'm doing this for Brett. He said, lift the energy, so I'm gonna do that for Brett. And Faith, she had three things to do. She had to read it out. Future, she, she messed it up. She read out two things. So I, I'm going to talk about cities. I'm going to talk about future. And I'm talking about relevance. And the only relevant slide, really, that's going to be traditional is going to be this slide. After that, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be on a journey. And I'm going to talk from the persona of an explorer. I think I'm an explorer, right? And you'll see the slide deck in terms of how I talk about it and what I talk about. I spent the last four months in uh, California. I'm originally from California, last 20 years in New Zealand. And I did learn, though, that I have ADHD. You can tell by the way I walk, but my family and friends decided to tell me that. 
oh well. <laughs> so this is uh, starting with a destination and a map. So I was in Lhasa, Tibet. I got on a bus, a small bus, making my way down to uh, Nepal and Kathmandu. Halfway along the journey, it's a one-day trip, I get out of the small bus, I have a little yak buttermilk. I'm with a friend that's a New Yorker, and we learn that base camp to Mount Everest is five days away. So we found a local and we constructed a map, right? And then we were off on our way. No idea where we were going. But my point here, and this is my theme of what I want to talk about today, is you have a vision. Whatever that vision is, it could be a 10-year horizon, a five-year horizon. It's a vision, and we have a map and how to get there. No way did our journey look like that, by the way, on the way to base camp. But we got there, and I'm here today. So I'm a, I started my, I did a three-year OE, right? I, I, I started in Sydney here, and I traveled through the world, and then I ended up in Harare, Zimbabwe with a baby. That's a story for another day. But that is what I say in terms of an explorer. And most of my explorations, they start typically with a city. I was, as a young lad, I was in the city of Berkeley, right? And Berkeley is known as uh, the home of the 1960s free speech movement. And I lived in this white, suburban, 95% white school that I went to, and they decided the best thing for Steve was to get him on a bus and take him into a 95% black neighborhood. I got beat up a lot, but I, I guess it worked out. In the 1970s, the city was 23% black. Today, it's less than 10% black. Now, there's still, you think of Berkeley, you think of activists. Doesn't mean you achieve everything you want to achieve. The city of Dharamsala in India, it's the home of Dalai Lama. Oh, I've got one eye, if you haven't figured that out already. That's me, and it's real. Another story for another day. Uh, so the prime minister at the time, he referred to this place called Dharamsala as the forgotten ghost town wasting in the woods. Well, the reality is it's the spiritual city for the Tibetan exile world. Think Dharmasala, you think spirituality. The city of Redmond, Washington, home of the bicycle capital of the Northwest, the only velodrome in the state of Washington. It's the home of Microsoft. You think of Redmond, you think technology. The city of Western Sydney, home of by the way, I want to say a time out here. I've really enjoyed what I've heard. I usually don't like these events that much, but there's been some really good content today. But eventually, I still figure out what it is the home of, by the way. And I think, I don't usually have notes, but I wanted to write Adam Leto, because we want to know what that is when you take it around the world. We want that vision pretty clear. It's the city of the future. Think Western Sydney, think, not sure yet, but I'm not from Western Sydney. Because the reality is, there's more than one future, right? When we create future scenarios, we think about universal income, we think about Bitcoin, we think about technology, we think we need to create a future scenario that is the preferred scenario, like it's the Everest Base Camp. Where are we going? We might change on our way there, but at least we need an aligned vision, particularly if we're gonna go around the world selling this vision of Western Sydney. So there's more than one future. But it's what is our future. Landing on, there's a multitude of plausible future states, right? We all know that. We can, we're taught that as young kids. We can be this or that or this. It's the pathway we take to this future state. So if Western Sydney is to be a city of the future, we need to acknowledge that this Horizon 3 is a des destination. It's a place we never get to. So if I talk a little more about this framework of three horizons, which I've spent a lot of time doing and spending with executive teams talking about this future state. And this is a model that McKinsey's Works uses a lot and other out, you know, consulting outfits. But if I give you some personal examples of Horizon 1, Horizon 2, and Horizon 3, this is Steve's perspective. I think organizations should spend about 70% Horizon 1, 20% Horizon 2, 10% on Horizon 3. However, from your experience, I've done, I do a lot of work with government, they spend about 98% in Horizon 1. That needs to change, particularly for Western City as a city of the future. So I used to work for Pitney Bowes, that Jim Collins book called Good to Great. Well, Pitney Bowes was one of the top 10 organizations. Good to great to nothing, right? They were totally aligned 
to the US postal system. They had 95% market share. Where are they today, right? They're gone pretty much. I mean, they're still in existence. I worked in Japan for three years for Alpine Electronics, a car audio manufacturer. And I thought I was cool, right? I had a CD changer, I had six CDs in the back, and I had a lot of music. I tell that to my kids, they think I'm a goofball. Well, they think I am anyway. Uh, when I was working for Microsoft, right, we came out with Encarta. I got a whole bunch of discs, so we displaced Encyclopedia Britannica. Now we've got an, an, Encarta on our, on our discs into our PC. Well, we know the outcome of that. So if we're going to be a future of the a city of the future, we constantly need to be asking ourselves this question in terms of what is possible. What is possible and what is changing. So from my experience, I'm going to talk a little bit about three critical aspects for future relevance. There's a lot more than three, but they've only, you've only given me 20 minutes, so I thought I'd come up with these three. So the first one is, it's a diversion think group. This is so important. And when I think about organizations, when I think about culture and capability, I don't see enough attention given to this one. A lot of lip service about what that future could look like. In fact, I've worked with over 100 large organizations to create future scenarios. Less than 10 have actually done anything with it. Why? Because it's really hard, really, really hard to plan yourself and continue to have a pathway into that future state. So you need the right culture and the right capability. So I will talk a little bit, oh, these are the three, a platform for innovation and partnering for success. So I'm all over the place, aren't I? Was I, was it, was I clicking that as I was talking? Okay, well, I'm a traveling explorer. I'm, I'm, I haven't lost, I'm now back. I get lost a lot, right, ADHD. Uh, and a corporate explorer, so I spent a lot of time uh, with, with organizations uh, as a corporate explorer, I've carried a lot of badges. I guess that's my point. I have experience with Telstra and KPMG and Microsoft doing, doing different things. But one of the things as in a, working within these organizations is they kind of want to know who you are, right? So everyone in this room at some time has gone through one of these psychometric tests. So I've done this recently, this TMP psychometric, psych, psychometric testing. And it comes out that I spend 90% 90, 90 of my time innovating, promoting, or developing. So what they call me as a, an explorer, an explorer promoter. That's my profile in terms of my work preferences. My work preference distribution, I took this test, and out of 200,000 people in Australia and New Zealand, uh, they have me categorized as more extroverted than 97%, more creative than 99%, Less structured, that, that scares a lot of people, 95%. Uh, so I guess the bottom line is I'm tripolar. So the reality is when I got these results, I called my, my three kids and apologized. They knew that already. And by the way, it was too late to apologize to my wife because that's gone down another pathway, another story for another day. So an organization that had a whole bunch of me would be dysfunctional. Totally dysfunctional. You need balances in terms of roles and capabilities, particularly if you're thinking about developing a future state. So my view is how we work together will underpin the change we hope to ignite and the future we strive to create. Now that's an easy line. This working model though, I find very difficult in terms of organizations that have the right chemistry to work together. So effectively, I have borrowed this from Bill Sharp, and he's from the Interna International Future Forum, this content in terms of the three horizons and the profiling. It's to simplify the message and the story that I'm trying to tell, but it's about a horizon one traditional leader, a horizon two entrepreneur, and a horizon three, a visionary, right? So if you think about that, now I drop these into my three horizon kind of scheme that I shared with you earlier. First, the other point I want to make though is the reality is just because I'm a, Horizon 3 guy, no question. But doesn't mean because I run a business line that I've got to spend time in Horizon 1. So we have to have the right mindset that enables us to move. But if I give you a sense of the profile, a Horizon 1 is a really traditional leader. We all know who they are. They're born in the pre-disruption era. They're focused on the status quo. You kind of get who they are, right? And, and they're needed. The Horizon 2 person 
Well, they thrive on disruption. They're actively looking for change. So that's a different kind of profile. The Horizon 3 visionary is impatient with the present, right? Open to future possibilities. And they kind of see things that are obscured to others, right? Because that's where we spend our time. So there's kind of different profiles in these three areas. The point here, though, and this is a hard model, I'm only going to give you one example, is the Horizon 1 person and the Horizon 3, third, the Horizon 3 person, if I look at the Horizon 1 person with heritage, the, the person that keeps the business going, that understands the business, and they see me as this Horizon 3 guy out there as the guy with hope, then we have a good chance of working together and being successful. However, when that Horizon 1 person looks at the Horizon 3, looks at me as this California guy that smokes weed, it's legal in California, uh, that smokes weed is irrelevant versus the, the, and I look at the Horizon 1 person as a dinosaur, which I've been guilty of in the past, then we don't work well together. So it's really critical that you're aligned as a leadership team or as an organization understanding how we're gonna work well together. The second is a platform for innovation. So this concept of adaptable and modernized. So this kind of goes back and reinfor reinforces that sheer pace of change is forcing leadership teams to create more structured in the way they anticipate the future. In other words, that has to be an active conversation. We have to keep constantly talking about the future because it's changing exponentially. So the, simple way, the simplest way to talk about linear is one, two, three, four, five. The e exponential concept is two, four, eight, 16, 32. So in five years' time, that's a speed of 32 times the speed of change. So it's happening now. I think there's most people agree that this kind of exponential cycle has changed. Now, if we agree that we're living in an exponential world in terms of change, and a lot of that is led by technology, but other scientific innovation, is that this concept, even if you don't know what it means, ask the question. If anyone's doing anything about building anything in the future, it needs to be loosely coupled and highly scalable. Now, it is a technical architectural term, but it doesn't need to be. It needs to be a, a, an understanding of different business units need to scale, not the whole organization because this one business unit needs to scale. And the same thing is if we believe in exponential change, therefore we have to build with the intent of displacing or replacing that technology, which is what I refer to as loosely coupled. So this loosely coupled, highly scalable model is really important. The next thing is changing the narrative. So from comfortable to uncomfortable with the future. So when I would do these, I, I've had a consultancy for years doing futures and foresight, and a lot of times, I would leave the room or I'd understand their strategy for the future and I'm like, wow. If they were all aligned or really comfortable with it, I'm like, you haven't pushed yourself hard enough. You should not be comfortable with the future state in terms of the level of change. This is a big one. This is digital transformation, I guess, versus business modernization. Now, there's a couple points here. So I sit on a couple advisory boards and from a tech perspective on one in the health sector, and they often look at projects as digital, right? And I'm like, no, the doctor needs this, and so does the nurse, and so do the patients. Stop looking at it as digital. And when we start talking about it as business modernization, then everyone's on board. Everyone's hooked in. However, the problem with that is that when we talk about technical transformation or digital transformation, we're often able to capitalize it because of the old accounting rules. In other words, when we talk about business transformation, it's harder to capitalize, but the technology isn't. I'll give you another example of what I mean by that. I've been a cloud guy for at least 15 years, longer than that probably, early adopter of the cloud. Now we're at a state that everyone should accept cloud is, is relevant. All the innovation is happening in cloud. However, when I often talk to a government department, that cloud spend, all cloud is OpEx, yet they want to squeeze it into a CapEx model. So my point is you need to change the narrative. You need to get aligned in terms of what the market's doing, particularly if you're a city of the future. And then last is from top down, bottom up, 
to middle on board. In other words, my experience is that it's easy, easier to get the executives on board. And when you bring in fresh people in an organization, they've got enthusiasm and passion and energy about what's possible. It's really critical that those level two, three, four, five, and six are aligned or nothing ever really happens. And if we're talking about a city of the future or an organization of the future, that has to be aligned so that we can navigate. And then this other bit is you have to move with speed. This theme is not new, it's come up. You gotta align, design, build, and integrate with an expectation. I don't remember who said it, someone said it earlier today, but with failure. I've had many startups. They've all failed or I wouldn't be an NAC, with all due respect, right? <laughs> So that's what happens. There's the 99 versus 1%. 99% of Phillips, uh, of startups could, I've always had customers, but they fail. And just because you're the city or just because you put money in it doesn't mean it won't fail. So then my last one is partnering for success. So we all understand this ecosystem of partnering. It's just the new way of, of doing business. Go read a Harvard Business Review or The Economist or the McKinsey stuff. It's all gonna say the same thing. It's around partnering. How effectively do we partner? So the way I look at NEC, so my, I lived in Japan for three years, and the guys were really keen in terms of patents and IP. And by the way, that's the same way NEC works. We have 100,000 employees. About 82,000 are engineers working on stuff all the time. Most of the revenue is in Japan. I, my trick as an innovation lead or to helping the future of, of, of Western Sydney or any other city, is how do I take out the magical IP? You're probably gonna, you might want a satellite, you might want the marine cables, you might want a database, the biggest supercomputer in the country, uh, in Japan, is by NEC. So it's how do we take out this technology and partner with you to be successful? And we have this concept, and our tagline is, orchestrating a brighter world. Well, the way we do that is a bunch of components. So you see smart transport, health, aviation, uh, digital government and, and, and citizen services. Now I got two minutes to go. I'm gonna get through these slides fast and the NEC guys are gonna be disappointed with This is all our stuff, by the way. Uh, so smart transport. The one thing I want you to leave with smart transport, we do it really well. By the way, when I lived in Japan, watches were in, by the way, and I could set my watch by the time of a train. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars the Japanese government on NEC equipment to keep that infrastructure going. So that should give you some confidence. This story I love. When I talk about the vault, right, it's not just NEC technology. There's a company that uh, was owned by, uh, owned by Denmark, right, for 40 years until KMD bought it in 2010, and then we got smart enough in 2019, 2019 and we bought it from them. But they have a whole bunch of technology which has enabled Denmark to be the leading uh, digital country in the world. And we have all that technology at our disposal. How do we pull it out of the vault and help in terms of partner within this ecosystem? Particularly, Greater Sydney, the city of the future. Well, you, you, you're gonna wanna be a CO2 neutral city, certainly by 2025. Why not leverage the experience and the results of Copenhagen in terms of the, the organization we've been working with? So this just reinforces the Denmark, the most digi digitized country in the world, was built on by KMD, which is the largest system integrator IT provider in Denmark, and now that's part of the, the, the NEC uh, family. And if you're interested, we have the articles, uh, David Borian or one of the others, we can provide you this, a bunch of research that's just concluded in the last two weeks in terms of assessing and analyze digital infrastructure and digital connectivity. And uh, last couple slides, intelligent digital airport. Uh, uh, so effectively, I talk about orchestrating a brighter world. Well, the reality is I want seamless everything. I want convenience. So we talk about customer experience. We talk about empathy. We want to start leading that way. And then what are the technologies that enable me to have a better experience doing whatever kind of engagement I'm doing, right? So we have that available and it's led a lot of it, and this is the area that I drive, particularly around innovation, is around biometrics. So we're the global leader in biometrics according to the NIST standards, and I know we get in a little bit of, hold on, China looks after everybody, but the concept that we talk about with our innovation, whether working with Delta, 
or Lufthansa or Air New Zealand or the Star Alliance is we're talking about opt-in, right? So we see that as a customer experience moving into the future. And now that my time says zero, we also have a lot of cool e-health services. And these don't matter, these quotes, just if I had extra time, the only thing I'll say, nothing is forever except change. I wanna give myself that quote, but I can't, because Buddha made that up. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>